All right, we are on chapter five of The Lost Keys of Masonry, The Legend of Hiram. Chapter five is entitled The Qualifications of a True Mason. But before we get into reading this, guys, I am on Instagram. I just created an Instagram to go along with this YouTube channel. So please click the link in the description of this video. Give me a follow on Instagram. I'm going to be uploading some content there as well. And let's continue into chapter five. All true Masons have come into the realization that there is but one lodge and that it and that is the universe. There is but one brotherhood, and this is composed of everything that moves or exists in any of the planes of nature. He realizes that the Temple of Solomon is really the temple of the solar man. Soul Om On, the king of the universe manifesting through his three primordial builders. He realizes that his vow of brotherhood and fraternity is universal and that plant, animal, mineral, and man are all included in the true Masonic craft. His duty as an elder brother to all the kingdoms of nature beneath him is well understood by the true craftsman who would rather die than fail in this his great obligation. He has dedicated his life upon the altar of his God and is willing and glad to serve the lesser through the powers he has gained from the greater. The mystic mason in building the eyes that, that see behind the apparent ritual recognizes the oneness of life manifesting through the destiny of form. And it says, a true disciple of ancient masonry has given up forever the worship of personalities. He realizes with his greater insight that all forms and their position in material affairs are of no importance to him compared to the life which is evolving within. Those who allow appearances or worldly expressions to deter them from the self-appointed tasks are failures in masonry, for masonry is an abstract science of spiritual unfoldment. Material prosperity is not the measure of soul growth. The true mason realizes that behind these diverse forms there is one connected life principle, the spark of God in all living things. It is the life which he considers when meaning the worth, or excuse me, when measuring the worth of a brother. It is to his life that he appeals for the recognition of spiritual unity. He realizes that it is the discovery of this spark of unity which makes him a conscious member of the Cosmic Lodge. Most of all, he must learn to understand that this divine spark shines out as brightly from the body of a foe as it does from the dearest friend. The true Mason has learned to be divinely impersonal in thought, action, and desire. The true Mason is not creed-bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that a Mason, his religion, must be universal. Christ, Buddha, or Mohammed, the name means little, for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, or cathedral, realizing with his truer understanding the oneness of all spiritual truth. All true Masons know that the only heathen are those who, having great ideals, do not live up to them. They know that all religions are one story told in many ways for people whose ideals differ, but whose great purpose is in harmony with Masonic ideals. North, East, South, and West stretch the diversities of human thought. And while the ideals of a man apparently differ when all is said and the crystallization of form with its false concept is swept away, one great truth remains. All existing things are temple builders laboring for a single end. No true mason can be narrow, for his lodge is the divine expression of all, uh, all broadness. There is no place for little minds in a great work. 
The Mason must develop the powers of observation. He must seek eternally in all expressions of nature for the things which he has lost because he failed to work for them. He must become a student of human nature and see in those around him the unfolding and varying expressions of one connected spiritual intelligence. The great spiritual ritual of his lodge is played out before him in every action of his brother man. The entire Masonic initiation is an open secret for anyone can see, or excuse me, for anyone can see it played out on the street corners of cities or in the untracked wilderness of nature. The Mason has sworn that every day he will extract from life its messages for him and build it into the temple of God. He seeks to learn the things which will make him of greater use in the divine plan, a better instrument in the hands of the great architect who is laboring eternally to unfold life through the medium of living things. The Mason realizes, moreover, that his vows taken of his own free will and accord give him the divine opportunity of being a living tool in the hands of the master workman. The true Master Mason enters his lodge with one thought uppermost in his hand. How can I, as an individual, be of greater use in the universal plan? What can I do to be worthy to comprehend the mysteries which are unfolded here? How can I build the eyes to see the things which are concealed from those who lack spiritual understanding? The true Mason is supremely unselfish in every expression and application of the powers that have been entrusted to him. No true brother seeks anything for himself, but unselfishly labors for the good of all. No person who enters a spiritual obligation for what he can get out of it is worthy of applying for the position even of a water carrier. The true light can only come, or excuse me, the true light can come only to those who asking nothing gladly give all to it. The true brother of the craft, while steadily striving to improve himself mentally, physically, and spiritually through the days of his life, never sets his own desires as the guiding star for his works. He has a duty, and that duty it is to fit in the plans of another. He must be ready at any hour of the day or night to drop his own ideals at the call of the builder. The work must be done and he has dedicated his life to the service of those who know not the bonds of time or space. He must be ready at any moment, and his life should be turned into preparing himself for that call which may come when he least expects it. The Master Mason knows that those who are of greatest use in the plane are those ones who have gained the most from the, practice or from the practical experiences of life. It is not what goes on within the titled lodge, or excuse me, within the tiled lodge, which is the basis of his greatness, but it is the way what he meets the problems of his daily life. The true Masonic student is known by his brotherly actions and his common sense. All Masons know that a broken vow brings with it a terrible penalty. Let them also realize that failing to live mentally, spiritually, and morally up to the highest standard which they are capable of con uh, conceiving constitutes the greatest of all broken oaths. When a mason swears that he will devote his life to the building of his father's house and then defiles his living temple through the perversion of mental power, emotional force, and active energy, he is breaking a vow which brings with it hours but eight, or excuse me, not hours but ages of misery. If he is worthy to be a mason, he must be great enough to restrain the lower side of his own nature, which is daily murdering his grand master. He realizes that a misdirected life is a broken vow, and that the daily service purification and the constructive application of energy is a living invocation which builds himself and draws to him the power of the Creator. His life is the, is the only prayer acceptable in the eyes of the Most High. An impure life is a broken trust. A destructive action is a living curse. A narrow mind is a strangle cord around the throat of God. All true Masons know that their work is not secret. 
they also realize that it must remain unknown to all who do not live the true Masonic life. If the secrets of Masonry were shouted from the housetops, they would be absolutely safe. Certain spiritual qualities are necessary before Masonic secrets can be understood by the brothers themselves. It is only those who have been weighed in the balance and found true, upright, and square who have prepared themselves by their own growth to appreciate the inner meanings of their craft. To the rest of their brethren, within or without the lodge, their sacred rituals must remain, as Shakespeare might have said, words, words, words. Within the Mason's own being is concealed the power which blazing forth from his purified being constitutes the builder's word. His life is the password which admits him to the true Masonic lodge. His spiritual urge is the sp sprig of Asatia, which through the darkness of ignorance will pr still proves that the spiritual fire is a light. Within himself, he must build those qualities which will make possible his true understanding of the craft. He can show the world only forms which mean nothing. The life within forever, or excuse me, the life within is forever concealed until the eye of spirit reveals it. The Master Mason realizes that charity is one of the greatest traits which the elder brothers have unfolded, which means not only properly regulated charity of the purse, but charity in thought and action. He realizes that all the workmen are not of the same step, but wherever they may be, they are doing the best they can according to their light. Each is laboring with the tools that he has, and he, as a master mason, does not spend his time in criticizing, but in helping them to improve their tools. Instead of blaming poor tools, let us always blame ourselves for having them. The master mason does not find fault. He does not criticize, nor does he complain, but with malice uh, towards none, and charity to all, he seeks to be worthy of his father's trust. In silence he labors, with compassion he suffers, and if the builders strike him as he seeks to work with them, his last word will be a prayer for them. The greater uh, the mason, the more advanced in his craft, the more fatherly he grows, the walls of his lodge broadening out until all living things are sheltered and guarded, guarded within the blue folds of his cape. From laboring with the few, he seeks to assist all, realizing with his broader understanding the weakness of others but the strength of right. A mason is not proud of his position. He is not puffed up by his honor but with a sinking heart is eternally ashamed of his own place, realizing that it is far below the standard of his craft. The farther on he goes, or excuse me, the farther on he goes, the more he realizes that he is understand uh, that he is standing on a sl on slippery places. And if he is allowing, or excuse me, if, if he allows himself for one moment to lose his simplicity and humility, a fall, is inevitable. A true mason never feels himself worthy of his craft. A student may stand on the top of a fool's mountain, self-satisfied in his position, but the true brother is always notable for his simplicity. A mason cannot be ordained or elected by ballot. He has evolved through, I, through ages of self-purification and spiritual transmutation, there are thousands of Masons today who are brethren in name only for their methods of living prevent them from receiving the slightest idea of what true Masonry teaches or means. The Masonic life forms the first key of the temple, and without this key, none of the doors can be opened. When this fact is better realized and lived, Masonry will awake and speak the words so long withheld. The speculative craft will then become operative, and the ancient wisdom so long concealed will rise from the ruins of its temples as the great spiritual truth yet revealed to man, the ancient and accepted Masonic rite. The true master Mason realizes the value of seeking for truth wherever he can find it. It makes no difference to him if it be in the enemy's camp. If it be truth, he will go there gladly to secure it. The Masonic Lodge is universal, therefore, 
all true masons will seek through the extreme or through the extremities of creation for their light the true brother of the craft knows and applies one great principle he must search for the high things in lowly places and he will always find the low things in high places any mason who feels holier than his brother man has built a wall around himself through which no light can pass for the one who in truth is the greatest is the servant of all many brothers make a great mistake in building a wall around their secret for they succeed only in shutting out their own light their divine opportunity is at hand the time has come when the world's or when the world needs the ancient wisdom as never before let the mason stand forth and by living the doctrines which he preaches show to his brother man the glory of his work he holds the keys to truth let him unlock the door and with his life and not his words preach the doctrine which he has so long professed the father of god and the brotherhood of man were united in the completion of the eternal temple the great work for which all things came into being and through which all shall glorify their creator and then it says epilogue and you know the next part's actually the epilogue is kind of long so i'm gonna i'm gonna read that in the next upload